12 stone. Welcome to church. Glad you're, you're with us today. And as, as, as our pastors just said, we're in the middle of this conversation that I think just has a lot of gravity and relevance to the reality that we live in. That we live in a complex world and we're asking the question, man, how do you live wisely in a complex world? And it's not easy. We live in a world that's like 15 button complexity and we have to have more than just two button answers to that. Here's the good news. I think God gave us a roadmap in the book of Daniel because the book of Daniel is the story of like these four young men who were removed from where they grew up in Jerusalem which was a city that all pointed back to God, where they all sort of shared similar values and priorities and certainly a similar worship of the one true God. And then they're exiled out of Jerusalem and brought to Babylon. And now we have to figure out how do you live for God in a culture that doesn't share that same faith? In fact, we established the fact that maybe you didn't know this yet, but we're not living in Jerusalem. We are exiles in Babylon. You're not living in a world that shares your values, and that's okay. Of course they don't. They don't, they don't worship the same God, so certainly they don't worship the same, they don't follow the same values. And by the way, if you've missed any of the weeks in this series, you've got to go back and catch up because I don't have time. You don't want me to go back and reteach every week, but, but I do want to give us a synopsis. You see, we've been using this continuum uh, that God just sort of dropped in, in our heart as we've been walking through this series as a roadmap, if you will, for how in the world we walk this out, that, that the reality is that Babylon always has an agenda. And Babylon always wants to form in us, in everybody, the things that will make us serve Babylon well. Of course it does. And it always starts with the ideas. The ideas of Babylon in the story of Daniel. Daniel starts out as soon as they get brought to Babylon. The first thing they do is say, we're going to teach you the language and the literature. Just Babylonian ideas. And then last weekend, we got all the way here where Babylon was saying, listen, we want you to eat the food of Babylon and that was when the ideas of Babylon kind of get inside of you and begin to form you and form your identity. That's where the next agenda of forming that Babylon has. And then eventually, it always ends up here where Babylon wants to form your worship and lead us towards idolatry where we don't worship the one true God. And, and we've watched as Daniel and the boys are figuring out how do we maneuver through the ideas into the identity eventually to idolatry of Babylon. And we just discussed the idea that, man, when it comes to Babylonian ideas, we can relax. Babylon's going to be Babylon. They got different ideas, and you can relax. But when the ideas of Babylon start to get in here and form your identity, we saw last week when they offered the king's food, Daniel said, hey, listen, for me, I got to refuse. You do you, boo-boo, but for me, I can't eat the food. I can't play the games that you play. I, it will dishonor God, and I have to stop here. And then today, we actually move all the way down here. When... Would you actually have to make the decision to say, I gotta, I gotta be, I gotta remove myself from the things of Babylon? And when I say remove, here's what I mean. Here's the definition. It means I, I can't be around it because it will form me and deform my relationship with God. So that's what idolatry does. And we're going to discuss two of the most well-known stories in the book of Daniel, and probably the stories we least know how to apply to our life. And so here's what we're going to do. It's going to be a little different day. I've asked Pastor Trey, our Snellville campus pastor, to come and teach a middle section for us. And here's what we're going to do. I asked him, I said, Pastor Trey, you're a great pastor, great preacher. You're funny. You're good. You got story. Here's what I need you to do. Take off your preacher pastor hat and put on your Bible professor hat, which means this. I don't want any stories. I don't want any humor, no jokes. Be boring. Not really, but just preach through the story, like get us into the story. So if you want to get ready, get your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 3 and Daniel chapter 6. And today we talk about the lion's den and the fiery furnace. Help me welcome Pastor Trey. Come on, man. Bring it. All right. Like you heard Jason say, we have just a few minutes to really dig into these stories. I kind of wanted to start with a joke, like somebody walks into a bar. Never mind. Um, we're going, to be, we're going to start in Daniel chapter 3, and, and the reason these stories go together is because they have the same principles of what does it look like to stand for God when pressure around us would lead us to bow to something or to someone else. And we're going to start with Daniel 3, and three young Jewish men named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and in Daniel 3 verse 1, here's how it begins. 
Nebuchadnezzar the king made a statue of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits and its width six cubits, and he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So what King Nebuchadnezzar has done is he's made a statue of himself. It's about 90 feet tall, puts it out in a plain near Babylon so that everyone inside of Babylon could see it. And then he makes a decree. Here's what that decree is. To you, the command is given, you peoples, nations, populations of all languages, everybody in Babylon, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of musical instruments, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down, and worship shall immediately be thrown into the middle of a blazing fire. So what happens is at this moment, the king says, hey, whenever you hear the music, no matter where you're from, no matter your religious background, no matter your ethnicity, if you're in Babylon, every single person is to fall down and worship the idol statue, or they're going to face the fiery furnace. You see, what's interesting, by this time, many Jewish men and women have been exiled into Babylon. And over the course of the years, Jewish men and women began to actually gain influence in Babylon, and they were building their families, and they were doing okay in Babylon. And some scholars believe that that angered some of the core Babylonian officials in such a way that this whole scheme of resurrecting a statue that people need to bow to was uh, specifically directed at pushing down the Jewish men and women. Because for Babylonians, it was no big deal to add another idol to who they worshiped. They were already polytheistic in their religion. So add another God, no big deal. But what they had learned about Jewish men and women is core to their faith was that there was only one God and only he was worthy of worship. And so now Jewish men and women specifically are being challenged by this idea. Do they compromise their faith in God and bow to this idol or are they thrown into the fiery furnace? And there's three men, like I said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who when faced with the decision to bow, the music plays, they stay standing because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego determined that they could not bow to an idol. Knowing the cost of the furnace, they choose to stay standing for God because they could not and would not compromise their worship of the one true God. Let's take a moment. I want to talk about idols for a second. Because there are literal idols like this. Images or statues of other gods, demons, other deities, even Satan himself that people worship. These idols could be small. They could be large made of wood, stone, other precious metals. And, and these idols would literally, for people, represent the presence of this other deity or this other God. And people all over the world bow to idols like this. The, uh, the irony is the ones who make the idol are the ones who worship the idol. When I uh, write out these type of, of talking about other gods and, and deities and spirits and kings in my notes, by the way, I use like a little G for God and a little K for king and a little S for spirit uh, because I'm petty like that. Um, because there is only one God that gets capital letters when I write in these notes. So it's important. Uh, and this type of idol, though, th there may be another type of idol that we may be more familiar with. It's not an idol made of wood or stone or precious metals, but it's an idol nonetheless. Namely this, that there are people, there are ideologies, there are values, there are desires, there are things that take the place of God in our hearts. And anything that takes God's rightful place in our heart is an idol. And I can't give a ton of definitions to or specifics to what we face, but there is no shortage of idols around us or in us. But hold on to this definition for your own application as we move deeper into Daniel 3 and Daniel 6. An idol is anything or anyone we worship other than God. So back to the story. King Nebuchadnezzar hears about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego choosing to not 
bow to this idol. He invites them into the palace and he's going to test them. He's going to give them another opportunity to bow. And here's how it plays out. Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, you, we are not in need of an answer to give you concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to rescue us. Hold on to that truth. That our God, he is able to rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if, on the count of three, everybody say even if. One, two, three. Even if. And even if he does not. Let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods, nor worship the golden statue that you have set up. Now, this is a defining moment because somehow Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are able to have great confidence in God's power to deliver them from the fire. And they're able to hold that confidence in tension with their commitment to God even if he doesn't actually rescue them from the fire. The original words used for even if there in the language that Daniel was written in, the first six chapters of Daniel are written in an ancient language called Aramaic. And the words used for even if carry layers of meaning. The words used for even if could also be translated as they could not be altered or would have the meaning of nothing. So you could almost think about uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saying back to the king something like, oh, that fire? We think nothing of it because our worship of the one true God will not be altered. See, the king threatens them with death in the furnace, but their hope their identity and their future are firmly placed on the God that will not let them down. Whether saving them from the fire or welcoming them home with him in death. These followers of God, because of that, these followers of God are unthreatenable. You couldn't threaten them. How good is that? That the threats of the king and Babylon against them could not get through to crush their spirits because their confidence was placed in God and in his love and in his power and in his provision that the threat of losing their lives bounced off of them. Their confidence in God was so high that nothing the king could throw at them could shake them. And so because they won't bow, the king throws them in the fiery furnace. I'm going to pause that story. We're going to move now to Daniel chapter 6, where we're going to see a similar story playing out for Daniel. Daniel chapter 6 takes place about 50 years later. This is At this point, King Nebuchadnezzar has died, and another king has risen to power named Darius. And 50 years later, there's a similar decree that has gone out over Babylon, and it says something like this. Daniel chapter 6, verse 7. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps and the high officials and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition by petition, that means prayer or worship, that anyone who makes a petition to any God or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Here's an interesting twist, and you see how the enemy begins to work on how I'm trying to compromise the worship of the one true God, because there's a twist between the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego story and the Daniel story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were told to do something that was outside of their conviction. They were told to bow to an idol. For Daniel, it, they were being told what not to do. You cannot do this. The first, they're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. The second, thrown into the lion's den. The first is, hey, Babylon, talking to the Jewish men and women, do like we do. And the second, Babylon, communicating to Jewish men and women, don't do like you do. You see, there are multiple schemes that all come together to compromise the worship of the one true God. See, and Daniel knew the law, but Daniel also knew what commitment to God would look like. So even though the law had been signed, 
Daniel does what he's always done. He goes up to his room three times a day, opens the window, gets on his knees, he bows, and he prays. And the enemies, knowing that Daniel would do this, they wait, they watch, Daniel prays, and they arrest him. They arrest him. It actually takes some convincing of King Darius because King Darius and Daniel were friends. And when they do that, they throw Daniel into the lion's den to be eaten by lions. Faithfulness to God has led all of these Old Testament heroes, all four of them, to remove themselves from idol worship and stay committed to worshiping God. Facing great cost, they still choose God. I want to wrap up these stories. I'm going to start back with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When we left them, they had been thrown into the furnace, and then this happens. The king was astounded, and he stood up quickly. He said to his counselors, was it not three men that we threw bound into the middle of the fire? And they replied to the king, well, absolutely, O king. He responded, look, I see four men untied walking about in the middle of the fire unharmed. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of God's. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of the blazing fire. And he says, listen to what's starting to happen in Nebuchadnezzar's heart. Because the three refused to bow, he begins to see something. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God. This is the same king who earlier erected a 90-foot statue of himself. Now he's declaring that somebody else is higher than him because of what he has seen. Come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the middle of the fire. The satraps, the the prefects, the, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men. I love this part. I love that it got included in scripture. Nor was the hair of their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had even the smell of fire touched them. But here's what I love. I love, I love that the English word that we chose to use there was trousers. I don't know. I just, I find that funny. <laughs> but what the author of Daniel is wanting to convey here is they didn't just get through it, but God worked in such a way that it was hard to describe other than to say, we threw them in the furnace and they don't even smell like smoke. This is the power of our almighty God. And it it wasn't just that he rescued them, it's that he was with them. Don't miss the miracle of his presence. Don't miss the miracle of his presence where the king had no other words. As he saw a fourth in the fire, he looks into the fire and there's one so bright, so majestic that he says the fourth looks like the son of God's. What many Christian scholars believe today is that the fourth in the fire was not just an angel, but we believe that the fourth in the fire was Jesus himself. Uh, Scholars refer to this as a Christophany. A Christophany is a pre-New Testament appearance of Jesus. That before Jesus came to earth as a baby, lived as a man, died on the cross and rose from the dead, prior to that moment, he appears. The second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, the one true God, does not just rescue his followers from the fire, he's with them in the fire. Praise God for how he saves us. And so they're saved. And we see much of the same with Daniel in the lion's den. King Darius, after throwing Daniel in the lion's den, the next day runs down to the den to see if his friend was still alive. And this is what King Darius says. Notice the similarities. 50 years later, we have a king who says, servants of the Most High. Now Darius looking at Daniel. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you continually serve. It's included in here as continually because clearly what Daniel did, he didn't give up praying and he embraced the lion's den. He wasn't going to give up worshiping his God. This God whom you continually serve, has he been able to rescue you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth and they have not harmed me. 
So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatsoever was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And Daniel was also rescued from death. See, what helps me love Old Testament stories like this and why it helps us today and why it's enduring today is because the same God that they served back then is the same God that we serve today. We can't miss this. God literally saved Daniel and the three from the furnace and the lion's den, but they thought that they might die, yet they still chose the rescue of God. They were willing to die rather than bow because they knew that God in his love would always rescue because whether he rescued them from the fire or the lion's den or he rescued them into his hand for eternity, God would always rescue. And whether he rescues you from the fire and us from the fire or if he rescues us into his hand for eternity, he always rescues. And we see the power of people being faithful to God and choosing not to bow. And we see it in a very interesting place because King Darius, a Babylonian, a polytheist, people setting decrees for people to worship him after seeing the power of God in Daniel's life, listen to what a Babylonian king has to say about our God. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? And here's the key for us today. The true hero of the book of Daniel is not Daniel. It's Daniel's God. And it's Daniel's God. And it's Daniel's God who we worship and serve and follow and bow to today. And he deserves our praise. Give God praise. Give God praise. Come on, babe. If, you, if you're not ready to run through a wall right there, you need to check your pulse because that is, that is good in fact, that, that story is one of my favorites in all of scripture. When you see God show up like that, by the way, we believe that's a true story. That's not a fable or a fairy tale or something passed down. We believe it happened. But here's the thing. I think it's a story that you probably know the best from the book of Daniel, but we know how to apply the least. What do you do with a story like that? I don't know of a bunch of fiery furnaces that are sitting out there waiting for us. I, I, I'm not aware of a lion's den. I, I mean, I watch Tiger King, but that's something completely different. I'm not aware of, of, a, of a lion's den I'm going to be thrown in. I, I, I don't see a giant statue I'm supposed to bow to. And yet, Babylon is very similar to where we live today. It's just a little bit more, uh, a little more sneaky how it plays out. And let me tell you, our heart as a church, our calling as a church is not just to sit in a story like that and go, won't he do it? And then you go home and go, what am I supposed to do with what he did? <laughs> it's one of the reasons why uh, tomorrow night we're having parent night, where we're going to literally unpack how in the world do you raise kids in Babylon? Because if you got it figured out, write the book, I'll buy it, we'll save our, all of our time together. But it's complicated. If you want to be a part of that, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, Morrisville campus, text parent night to 37748. Give us your questions. We want to be on your agenda. Help us figure this out together because it's complicated. Walking through this continuum in Babylon is complicated, and it all comes back to the fact that Daniel and his boys were rooted in Jerusalem, rooted in God, surrounded by God's people and God's truth and God's values, and you could walk this out wisely, and that's what we want to help teach us to do. So I'm going to apply this today. The story is phenomenal, but we have to know how to apply the story. So when do we make the choice to relax, to refuse, or to remove? And I know I asked the question, but I want to flip it on its head, actually, because here's the reality. We actually don't get to choose all of it. Here's the first thing. Uh, God chooses where we can relax or where we must refuse. Let me just play it out. 
God defines what is good and evil, what is right and wrong, what is sin and what is righteous. And it's in his word. And the reality of being rooted in Christ and rooted in his word is what allows you to know the difference between I can relax, that's not sin, and I have to refuse because that's sin. You and I don't get to decide this. And by the way, I don't care how far Babylon drifts or how generations come through and we like to redefine things or we like to change things or we think we know better. This does not change. You can choose not to listen to God, but God actually draws these lines for us. And then, don't miss it, but it continues on because when God says it's sin, I don't care what Babylon says, if God says it, we believe it. And then when we decide we're going to refuse then we have less decision here than we might think we do. I want to play it out. If you, you hit something in life, what would it look like? What, is it, what does it look like for us today to be tempted to bow to an idol? Like I said, I don't know if some 90-foot gold statue sitting out there that we're supposed to like bow to, but I think there's things that play out. Like, like maybe you work for a company and your boss asks you to cheat something in the accounting or the books, and you're like, eee. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're in a company and you're supposed to like lie to a client about something and you know God already says what lies are, they're sin, I can't. Maybe, maybe you're in a dating relationship and you're being pushed to cross lines that God's drawn and you know. And you're going to bow in that moment? Are you going to refuse in that moment? Maybe you go to a party or an event and everybody's consuming in ways that don't honor God. And what are you going to do with that? And then you might be a part of a, a hobby or a sports team or travel that requires you to miss church every week. Or students, you miss Wednesdays every week. You got to think, man, am I going to just keep going that way? Or do I have to reconsider what it means to be a part of something? Students, you got prom this week and next week. There are lines that all your friends in Babylon are going to cross. What will you do? See, whatever job, team, relationship asks you to violate the truth of God, that's the moment where you have to decide, what are you going to do? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they had their moment. We have ours. Here's what I would say we do. Here's the first thing we always do when confronted with something that violates God's truth. Ask for permission to refuse. Daniel did it. Daniel 1.9. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself. Remember the food. Eat the food. Eat the food. Daniel's like, listen, do you mind if I just don't eat it? Can I refuse? You eat what you want. But for me, do you mind if I don't? And if they say yes, here's the second step. If you're given permission to refuse, stop there. If you're in sales, like once you have the sales, stop talking. <laughs> If you get permission to refuse, and Daniel did something even more strategic. He didn't just refuse. He brought a better solution. Hey, listen, you mind if I don't eat it, but I'll, I'll eat water and vegetables. Let's, let's just test this thing in 10 days. Brilliant approach for Daniel. And the guy said, yeah, you can eat it. But listen, you stop if they give you permission to not violate your convictions and God's truth. And listen to me. If Babylon lets you stop here, stop here. I don't think that, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if they said, listen, we're not going to bow. And, and if Nebuchadnezzar said, that's cool, you can just refuse. They wouldn't have been like, sweet, I'm running to the fiery furnace anyway. They'd have been like, thank you. We're going to keep worshiping God. And, and I believe also if Daniel would have asked to have permission not to eat the diet of the king, the food, and instead of saying yes, I believe if they said, no, you're going to eat it. You know what would have happened? Babylon would have pushed him to remove. I think Daniel would have gone to the fiery furnace or the lion's den over the diet. But when they give you permission to just refuse, stop there. But then if they don't, if you're not allowed to refuse, you have to eventually get to the point where you go, I would be willing to die on this one. There are things that are more valuable than your life, your possessions, your job, your home. Your soul is more valuable than any of those things. And when you violate the truth of God, you might save your house, your job, your influence, but lose your soul. And here's the reality, what it would look like to get to the place of removal. You might have to quit a job, break up with someone you're dating, leave a party, leave an event, lose influence, step out of a relationship because there's things you cannot cross because God decides those. But here's the other reality. You cannot remove the consequence of remove. See, they knew if I bow... I'm good to go, but if I don't bow, I'm going to the fiery furnace. They knew the consequences. And believers, listen to me. You cannot remove the consequences when you say, I can't cross that line. 
See, we want our cake and eat it too. Like, hey, I'm just going to live for God and I'm not going to do what you say and I'm going to refuse. And if you want me to, I'm going to remove. Oh, I lost my job. How does that work? Oh, I lost influence in that arena, that friend group. There's always consequences when you remove. It might be like you might lose a customer, a client, or a contract because you go, I can't, I can't cross that line. It might mean you lose a promotion or you fall off the corporate ladder you're climbing and you go, I have to start over again. Yeah, you do sometimes. Maybe you lose a relationship, the person you're dating and you're single or single again. You might lose a friend group, might lose influence. And listen, for us, it's not right now a fiery furnace or a lion's den, but don't miss this. Across the world, there are Christians who are in those situations. There are Christians who are literally giving up their life, like not like metaphorically, literally going, will you bow to this God? And they're going, no, there's only one God. And they're giving up their life before bowing. And we look at Daniel and think, that's so far back. And I stress out about the thought of like you losing a job or a relationship. They're like, no, every day Christians are losing their life around the world because they refuse to bow. And I just want to say it. We're not there yet. Thank God. In America, where, where you're sitting today is not there yet. But listen, I need to say it. There might be a day where we're not allowed to just stop at refuse. By the way, we're at refuse in most places in America culturally, where it's like, listen, Babylon out here can believe what they want to believe. And they're, they're allowing us to just say, we're going to let you refuse. But for us, we, we're going to let you do what you want. But for us, we have to refuse. And currently, that's where it can stop. The worst that can happen is you get canceled, not you lose your life. But listen to me. Scripture says there will be a day, whether it's in my lifetime or not, where you, they're not going to let you stop at refuse and it's going to get to remove. And I want to say it before we get there because it's way easier to say in peacetime than when it happens. I need you to know that there might be a day where I or this church is forced to move from refuse to remove for our biblical stances on things like sexuality, biology, gender, identity, marriage, truth, lies, whether it be from government legislation or cultural pressures, I need you to know that we are going to hold the lines of the Bible, whether it costs our livelihoods or our lives. You need to know it now, and I want to encourage you to make that decision now. That is the call of the church. But I want to flip the script because equally, I, want, I don't want you to miss this. When Daniel went to his window to pray, Scripture says that it's the thing he did over and over again. It wasn't the first time he did it. Here's what I mean. When he was praying, Daniel was not protecting his rights. He was protecting his roots. He was not making a political stance. He wasn't trying to protect whatever his First Amendment was. He wasn't concerned with the decree of the government. He was concerned with his soul. When he went to pray, he was saying, yeah, 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 cool. I'm praying to stay rooted in my God so I can live this wisely and have the courage and wisdom I need to do it. He wasn't holding a picket sign fighting for his rights. He was merely protecting his roots. And the same is true for us today. I would not die over political stuff. But I would die over scripture. And that's the call of believers. So here's the two things. And we're going to end some time to pray together. I wanted to leave space. Because this series so far has been a lot of information. Hopefully helpful. But at some point it has to go from information to transformation. And there's, there's things I can't get to. There's specifics I could, I could spend all day and wouldn't get to everything. And I believe that that's the beauty of prayer, that God can speak into things. I think there's two places God might invite you to be prayed over or us to pray over you for, and it's wisdom or courage. Because living this out takes both wisdom and courage. And I want you to see how this will play out. See, when you lack wisdom, here's the tendency. You start to choose remove unnecessarily. Where you go, listen, Will you let me refuse? And they go, yeah. And you go, cool, fiery furnace anyway. I'm out. And here's the problem. When you do that, you lose influence with the people God calls you to reach. You know what Jesus said in Matthew 5? He said, you are the salt of the earth. That's Christians, followers of Jesus. That's what we're supposed to be. 
It, he didn't say, you are up on a hill and you're a monk praying for the rest of your life. No, go get in the recipe of the earth and be salt. Bring the flavor of the kingdom of God to the boardrooms you sit in, the classrooms you sit in, the cul-de-sacs you live in. Bring the salt. Flavor it. There is a kingdom of God that is not just a religion of rules, but there's a love and a savior. Bring the salt. But when you lack wisdom... You begin to remove yourself unnecessarily where you could have just said, refuse, you do you, I'll do me. And they just said, cool. And the way we justify is we call ourselves martyrs. I died for my beliefs. No, you died because you were kind of foolish. My boss had an idea that wasn't godly. And I quit the company tomorrow. I'm done. Let's go. I'm a martyr. No, you're a moron. No, you're lacking wisdom. <laughs> You're supposed to be in the world, salt. So Jesus said, that's our calling as a church. When you lack wisdom, that's how it plays out. And I'm just gonna, I don't have time, let me say it quick. There are seats and tables and rooms that God has called his church to be in. Seats of influence in Babylon. Daniel was one of the most influential people in all of Babylon. And he never dishonored his God and never lost his relationships. And he still managed this refuse wisely. And then when he did remove, he didn't expect the consequences to be removed. And God said, no, I still want you in the right rooms. And God saved him. And I wonder if we've given up seats of influence because we remove unnecessarily, equally, when you lack courage, here's what happens. You choose to bow instead of remove. So you hit places where you go, I can't partake. And they go, cool, you're gonna. And you go, yeah, I can't though. And they go, well, then there's a fiery furnace or lion's den waiting for you. And you go, well, in that case, and you go back here and you relax and you bend the knee. Here's the problem. When you live with lack of courage, you lose God's influence in your life. And your soul, you know that you've bowed to something. You see, we love the fiery furnace story because we know how it ends. If you were my kids, you'd say, get to the good part, Dad. There's a fourth man in the fire. Come on, somebody. You know what they were thinking? We're going to die in the fire. Period. No happy ending. See, when you lack courage, you bow in places that violate your relationship with God. You violate what God, the honor God deserves. Here's how Jesus says it in Matthew 5, verse 13. He said, you are the salt of the earth. Covered that. But if the salt loses its saltiness, meaning if the salt bows to things that they're not supposed to bow to, when you're supposed to say, I can't bow, when you, when you lose your saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Here's the deal. You're supposed to be salt in the world. If you remove your salt from the world, you can't be salty. But if, if the salt loses its saltiness and stays in the world, it has no use. So you've got to somehow walk this thing where you don't lose your saltiness and don't pull your saltiness. And somehow Daniel did that in a way that pointed a nation towards the God that he served. Because ultimately, church, this is not a conversation about how to guard yourself and protect yourself from scary Babylon out there. Your goal is actually to be salt in Babylon, to form Babylon. Yeah, Babylon's got things they're trying to form in, in everybody, but you got the power of the Holy Spirit to actually form back this way. Both kings were idol worshipers. They saw how Daniel served his God, and then they saw how Daniel's God was powerful and mighty. And both kings said versions of the high and mighty, the almighty God, the God of Daniel. They went from worshiping those gods to then suddenly coming back this direction towards the things of God. That's what we're supposed to do, church. We don't have to fear Babylon because we're rooted in Christ, but we should be helping to form Babylon. The thing that's just so humbling is when I think about Daniel, he was 80 years old at the lion's den. 
he'd seen all of Babylon. He'd seen all of God. And it's like, don't you think when the lion's den came, Daniel's like, didn't we do this already, God? And the tension for Daniel would be to either get cold towards God for letting him go through a second testing moment or to get cold towards Babylon because God already did a miracle in the fire before. And yet somehow Daniel stayed soft hearted towards God and soft hearted towards people. And don't pretend that's easy to do. It's why we're going to leave space at the end. Because I wonder if you're here and you need one of two prayers. And by the way, we're a church, if you didn't know. So we believe that there is a God who we pray and he actually, our prayers move God's hand here on earth. We believe there's two things you might ask God. The first is a prayer for wisdom. And here's what James 1.5 says. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God what we're going to do together. Who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. You might need wisdom and you look at your life and you look at the scenario and go, I don't know where I'm at on this whole thing. God, I need wisdom. Gosh, I don't want to bow to idols, but equally, I've got people I care about in this whole thing. Will you give me wisdom to know how to walk through the minefield of this world by which I don't bow and equally I don't unnecessarily remove myself? We want to pray for that kind of wisdom. You might be in a parenting situation, a work situation, a school. Let us pray for you. Secondly, you might need courage in Joshua 1, 9. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Whether in the fire or the lion's den or in the boardroom or in the penthouse, God is with you. And you might need the courage because you already know you tried this and now you're deciding are you going to bow or are you going to face the consequences of removal? And you need the spirit of God to give you courage. And it might be costly. There's nothing more costly than your soul. There's a third group. You might be sitting here going, wow, that was a lot. I don't know that I believe this whole Jesus thing. And I'm glad you're here. You might be like the kings in the story of Daniel where you don't know the God of Daniel yet, but you sit here and go, I'd like to. We'd love to offer, help you, lead you in that prayer of salvation. And you might come and ask for prayer. So do this with me here across the camps as prayer teams gather across the front. Just begin to get in your place and we're just going to give some space. And you might just come up and say, I need a prayer for wisdom. Great. You might get more specific. Great. Or courage. Or salvation. Would you allow us to just have some space to pray over you? Because the story of Daniel is awesome. It's great information. What we need today is transformation. So campus pastors, join me on stage. And would you lead us into this moment of prayer? So right here at the Lawrenceville campus. Would you stand with me? I'm going to ask you a, a favor. Would you just protect the next 10 minutes? I am the most impatient person in the room. And if I'm in the moment like this, I'm like, let me sneak out the back and get done. Will you just do me a favor? Just guard the next 10 minutes. The band's going to sing and you might just stand and worship. And that might be what you do for 10 minutes. And you just need to be reminded of who God is. And that's what worship does in a lot of ways. But you might be sitting there going, man, I would love to be prayed over. Prayer teams across the front, you just literally come down, walk up to one of them and go, hey, will you pray for me? How can I pray for you? Courage, wisdom, salvation, or more specifics, your call. They're not going to do anything weird. They're just going to put a hand on your shoulder. They're going to pray for you. And what if God in a minute could give you a courage you thought you never could have or give you a wisdom and an insight and go, I see it. I see how to not eat the king's food and also not be removed from the king. What if God, he would. So you have space. Maybe you're with your spouse and you just sit down with your spouse and go, let's pray together. Awesome. I love that. But just would you preserve and protect what God wants to do over the next 10 minutes? And then Pastor Paul will be up. He'll give us a soft dismissal. You can line up. You can line the aisles. I don't care how many people come down. There's a God who wants to meet you and give you courage and wisdom. So worship well. Guard these next few minutes. Would you know that the God of Daniel is the God that we serve? Worship well.
worship. This is how it's my mind bounds. We surrender it all. He's the one that goes before us. So we wage war not with flesh and blood. But we wage war in the spiritual realm. And he's here on our behalf. Come on, we sing this together. It may look like how. that some of you may be guests today and maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus and he, and he came to church because of I don't know why and you're asking the question like what does it mean to like feel Jesus I hope you felt Jesus today because this is what it feels like this is what it feels like to be in the presence of God it's not an emotion it's not some contrived behavior. It's supernatural and I can't really explain it to you. But I know that this is, what it's, this is what it feels like. So listen, today, like for some of you, you got some clarity today and you got some wisdom and you're like, thank you God, I know exactly what to do with that and I'm gonna take that out there and I'm gonna, I'm gonna make an impact for your kingdom and my relationships and in my community. For, for others of you, you got some courage today. You prayed, God answered, and he said, I'm gonna give you some courage today, and you felt it, and you're confident, and you're bold, and you're ready to go. For others of you, you're still trying to figure it out today. Listen, don't leave, <laughs> don't leave. Don't leave the presence of God when he's still working inside of you. He's trying to talk to you. <laughs> He's trying to clarify something for you. So as people are walking out that way and, and they've got things settled with God, if you're unsettled with God, then stay in the room. I don't, I don't care if you use the aisles. I don't care if you stay in your seat. We're gonna be here until you're done. Band's gonna be here until you're done because the presence of God is here. So let's engage with it. So we love you for, for the rest of y'all. I'm just gonna ask, like, just keep the environment sacred. 
You know, head out to the lobby in a soft way. Let these people just do their business with God. And we'll see you next week, okay? We love you. Hey, those of you who joined us online, we are so incredibly thankful you're with us. We hope this blessed you today. And yes, people are still here being prayed over. We talked a little bit earlier about how just admitting that we need prayer makes yeah. a huge thing. So. Yeah, I, I was just saying like, like I, I struggle with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it, 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 it puts you in a position of weakness. Yes. And as like humans, like we don't like to be seen right. as weak. Yeah. But it's actually a position of strength because when we are humble, <laughs> yes. God's strength is yeah. what brings us through through yeah, our humble humility. Yourself in the light of the Lord, and He will lift you up. That's what it is. So, so you're hey, actually in your most strongest position. That's right, because yeah. He's the one lifting you. Yeah. So anyway, I, here's the reality: uh, we would love the privilege of praying with you. You're not in the room, but you can text prayer to three seven seven four eight, and we'll get a hold of you this week. And we don't have to spend long on the phone. Maybe just five, ten minutes, just to hear what's going on in your life. And maybe you need courage. Maybe you need wisdom. Maybe you want to talk about salvation. But we would love the privilege of praying over you and with you this week. Yeah, and, and just like when I was talking about the presence of God being in this yeah, room, that's right. the, the coolest thing about the presence of God <laughs> is He can be in your room and yeah, this yeah. room at the same time. He's not I don't understand it, but clearly God is probably moving where you are as well. And so, you know, every time you're with a group of people, we just always like to have conversations. Yes. So we kind of want to use conversation to direct our prayers today. Right, right. And it's like, which one of those prayer, courage, wisdom, or salvation, do you want to pray through in your group? Right, right, do it. And um, listen, God will be there. His presence is there. Hey, He loves you. If you're not a follower of Jesus yet, just keep coming, keep asking questions, keep being curious, and we believe that God's going to pursue you. So, hey, thanks for being here this week. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see you next week. Yeah.